Hello, thank you, Johnny. Yeah. Now we are showing Master's first lectures uh, in the first three or four uh, from 1987, one by one, from the last October. Uh, this is uh, maybe 11th, 12th time. I'm not sure about that. Okay. Uh, originally, uh, I thought uh, the, the title was uh, What is Happy Science? What is Happy Science? But uh, I changed my mind to this theme, the theme, the discovery of enlightenment. Okay. Uh, as you may know, enlightenment is the kind of biggest theme in Buddhism. In Christianity, it will be love, love. And uh, Buddhism, it is uh, enlightenment. In happy science, those who think enlightenment, uh, love is both the big, big theme. But uh, okay, today main theme is uh, enlightenment. Uh, what is enlightenment? Enlightenment is to know you are true self as a spiritual being, which is living in your physical body. Physical body itself is not you. It's a kind of a garment or a kind of a car you, you drive. So the true self is in you. This is the, to know this true self is enlightenment. Also, uh, secondary, the enlightenment is to come closer to God by one step. So there are many stages of the enlightenment. After you got some enlightenment, you need to find another enlightenment. So we have no limit in that. So enlightenment is coming step closer to God or Buddha. And also, also uh, with enlightenment, there accompanies a great joy, spiritual joy. So this is the greatest happiness we can enjoy as a human being. So actually, uh, we are seeking happiness in happy science, but this happiness is quite different from usual happiness, like becoming successful and becoming rich or like that. It is a happiness of enlightenment we are seeking. As an individual, we are seeking happiness of enlightenment. As a whole, we are seeking to create utopia on earth. This, this, this kind of happiness we are seeking in happy science. Okay. Now we enter a uh, this today's lecture is uh, kind of 70 minutes. So I divided it into three parts. And uh, I first like to show you the first part, 25 minutes or so. Hello, everyone. I finally made it to Kyushu. I didn't expect to give such a big lecture here at such an early stage. I'm very happy to see you. What's more, we are blessed with beautiful weather. I woke up feeling very refreshed this morning. It's great that I can see you and give a talk on such a beautiful day. This is only my second public lecture this year. So I'm very happy to see you at an early point in the year. Earlier, I was having a chat in my dressing room. We talked about how a venue with 4,000 seats will be too small next year. We'll need one for 5,000 to 7,000 people. Hearing such ambitious prospects, I was very much encouraged. But it's not about the splendor on the outside that I'm going to address today. Under the title, The Discovery of Enlightenment, people tend to be fascinated by big movements or momentum and forget their position. But as a seeker of the truth, you must be aware that what goes around comes around, and you will reap what you sow. 
You must always return to the starting point. Today, among the over 2,000 people here, I heard that over 1,000 are non-members of Happy Science. I can't give a talk just for our members, so I'll talk about where the entrance to enlightenment is and how we can enter it. I'll also talk about how enlightenment develops, what the state of enlightenment is, and how we must strive to maintain it. I like to talk about these topics in the context of everyday life. You have probably come here today because you have read at least one of my books and have come to know Happy Science. I don't know which book you read first, but I'm sure you have read one. I wonder how you felt after reading it. I sometimes imagine this and feel happy that each person has had a unique opportunity to encounter the truth. Looking back at my own experience, I encountered the truth about eight years ago. I felt something as I kept reading books that contained the truth. I strongly sensed that something was about to happen to me. I wasn't sure what it was, but I sensed a new mission would soon start for me. By reading those books, I felt a strong passion welling up from within. It was a completely different sensation from what I got from reading literature. I felt my soul move and shake. I had recognized myself as a being with a physical body. But I felt another self that surely existed within me. It began to move inside me. The other me started to move. And it told me, now is the time to know your true self. It was an intense feeling. But at that time, there wasn't enough material for me to judge which path I was being invited into. So I used all the intellect and reason I had at the time to clarify what it was. Why was such a phenomenon happening to me? What would be the consequence of all this? How can I understand the process of what is happening? How would other people see the phenomenon that is happening to me? If other people sounds vague, how would this phenomenon be classified in the commonly accepted standards of humanity? I kept thinking about these things and focused on observing myself objectively. I think I took a sound approach regarding this point. Why did I start by looking at myself objectively? I think it had a lot to do with how I had lived until the age of 24. When I started experiencing spiritual phenomena, it is true that I was intellectually seeking the truth at the time. I was reading various philosophical books. 
I read many books to cultivate myself. I was searching for something. I didn't know what it was, but I was accumulating knowledge in search of that. This is a fact. Then I sensed that what had been accumulating inside me was demanding I confirm the new phenomenon happening to me. It said, considering the many books you have read or the philosophies of great historical figures, what exactly is happening around you? What is this voice or this idea trying to tell you? Understand what it is. In the beginning, I had to rely on my limited amount of wisdom to make a judgment. A fragment of wisdom I had accumulated over a short span of 20 years. I had a hunch that something unknown was going to happen. I was about to set out into the unknown world or unknown ocean, but I had no navigator. No one knew about the ocean. I had to study the map myself and observe the sun and the stars to move forward. What was important at that point in time? Actually, I had confidence at my core. I surely had worries about how things would turn out for me after I started to experience spiritual phenomena. Looking back at my past, there were certainly trials and errors, mistakes, and times when I hurt others or felt confused. Even so, I couldn't deny the fact that I had lived single-mindedly, seriously, and earnestly. I felt that my confidence in my earnest and determined way of life would serve as a yardstick to gauge the new situation or my experience in the new world. At the time, I didn't know what God or Buddha was thinking or intending. I had certainly made some mistakes and failed at times. But if these things were removed, and if something absolute, God or Buddha I'd never met, exists, I thought he would surely approve of how earnestly I had been living. He would approve of how true I was to myself and my thoughts. I thought, this part of me should serve as a ground to explore the new world. I thus returned to the starting point. In the face of a new situation, what is the unshakable part in me? What is it I can be confident about? I will grasp it and make it a guide, a fulcrum of a lever, or the North Star. I continued to think about this and found the answer without being taught. From now on, many things will happen to you as well. You will experience many things. And as you listen to other people's opinions and experiences, you may sometimes lose sight of yourself. However, at that time, look calmly into your mind. Reflect on your past. I want to tell you this first. There is definitely something, a core, in your mind that you can be confident of. There is 
This something may differ from person to person, but a diamond-like core surely exists in every one of you. Maybe the word exist is inaccurate. During the decades you have lived since birth, you must have surely created something that sheds light, like a pearl in an oyster shell. You need to discover this pearl within you. You definitely have it. What makes a pearl a pearl? When looking at a pearl, no one can deny its value or beauty. This is a negative way to put it, but positively speaking, most people will see the value of the pearl. We don't have enough words to express the beauty of the pearl's brilliance. Can you describe the color and the brilliance of the pearl? I cannot. No words can describe that mystical rainbow color and brilliance. Even so, everyone will find it beautiful and brilliant when looking at it. What I mean is this, even oysters can create a pearl. So you too must have created your own pearl. During the 20, 30, 40, or 50 years of your life, Please know this and grasp it. When you leave this world, your thoughts, deeds, and your whole life will be examined. You will have to reflect on them. At that time, will you have something you can be confident in? Please check it for yourself. You definitely have something. Knowing this something is the starting point for you to set out on the untrodden world and take to sea without any map or sign. Merely accepting, memorizing, or interpreting what is written in books will not lead you to attain enlightenment. To discover enlightenment, you must first discover the core that lies within your own mind. This is unique to you. It's not others, but yours. You definitely have your own unique core you've created. It may be difficult for others to describe it, but you should all have a part of you that you are confident God would approve of if He exists. Please find out what it is. This will serve as the material to judge your thoughts and deeds. Please discover the part of you that you can confidently show or talk about, the only thing you can show to others. Without this, no matter how much you listen to my lectures or read them, enlightenment won't be yours but someone else's. Even if you buy my books and read them, what is written is not your enlightenment. The content of my books will be useful to polish the pearl within you. It will serve as a nutrient to make the pearl bigger. However, you must create your own pearl. Everything starts from the discovery of the pearl within. Discover it, polish it, and develop it. In this process, enlightenment will be found. This is the first point I want to make clear today. You can think about it now or after this lecture or take time when you get home. Grasp the pearl-like core within you. Please firmly grasp the part within you that you can confidently show others without hesitation. As you explore it, you will begin to understand what kind of soul you are. 
一体どういう魂であるのかこれが分かってくるのです。Everyone has a soul. Actually, it's wrong to say you have a soul. You yourself are a soul. The truth is, the soul has a physical body. This soul has a certain disposition or a tendency. What is more, you are not just created beings. You have also created something through hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of years of reincarnations. There is something you have accumulated. It is deeply engraved in your soul. The knowledge and experience you have accumulated through reincarnations. Or to be more direct, the enlightenment you have attained is your own. No one can take it away from you. Just like the color and brilliance cannot be taken away from a pearl. The brilliance of enlightenment you have gained through numerous reincarnations cannot be erased. Everyone surely has such brilliance. I just used the word reincarnation. There are perhaps more people who can't accept this idea. But it's been eight years since I've been experiencing spiritual phenomena. During that time, I published nearly 70 books, about half of which are spiritual messages. It would be impossible to write them if they were a fraud or a fabrication. I can do this because they are real. The world of the spirits is real. Some may believe that those who lived on the earth in a physical body just like you. Will become mere ash, water, and carbon dioxide after they die. They may believe that what they learned and experienced throughout their lives will come to naught. But to me, this is a fanatic and blind belief. I cannot believe such an idea, can you? If this were true, why have you lived so earnestly and made efforts? If you end up as ashes, what are your efforts, morals, or the teachings for? What is the purpose of educating your children? It's nonsense. You feel you have to make efforts in your life because you know something eternal in the depths of your mind. Somewhere in your mind, you feel you must keep on improving. Because you know that life doesn't end after one life or after several decades. Somewhere in your mind, you know there is a point in making efforts because you are living an eternal life. The memories of your past reincarnations are not brought back by others. You yourself can recall them. And it's easy to do so. As I said earlier, one of the ways to remember your past reincarnations is to examine the tendency or disposition of your soul. What kind of soul are you? It's important to know this. This is the first step. What kind of person are you? Look back at the kind of person you have been. You are obviously different from others and have a unique character. You have a distinct character or a unique characteristic that cannot be removed. Some people have boundless passion toward beauty. They have an unceasing zeal for what is beautiful. 
Artists are like this, and such people exist among non-artists as well. Some people cannot contain their passion for beauty. They clearly have this tendency in their souls. No doubt they have accumulated many beauty-related experiences throughout their reincarnations. Others have a passion for studying. No doubt such souls have studied many things as they went through reincarnations. They have such a tendency of the soul. There are others who are highly sensitive to music and have a unique musical sense others don't have. Their souls definitely have a history of loving music. The tendency of your soul lies in what you are fond of the most or what you desire the most. To put it another way, it lies in something you naturally want to do when you are most relaxed. First, I want you to know what kind of person you are. Okay, uh, on the first bus, Master Ryuho Oka told us two things to how to find our true self. One is to discovering the inner power you created in this lifetime. Master told us like this, uh, there's definitely something uh, core in your mind that you can be confident of. During the decades you have lived since birth, you must have surely created something that shed light like a pearl in an oyster shell. And you need to discover this power within you. You definitely have this power. First, Master taught us you must find the power in you. And Master teach, uh, sometimes told us you have a diamond in you. Diamond. And so today, Master taught us you have a power in you. What is the difference of this diamond and the power? Okay. A diamond, when Master taught about diamond, it is about your uh, Buddha nature. Buddha nature. Buddha nature is something we are given as uh, humans. Uh, that is a uh, part of Buddha's right. And uh, this Buddha nature is same in everybody. Everybody has the same Buddha nature in origin. So it's a diamond. It never changes. It's an everlasting one. But about the power, power is unique to each one. Power is something to be created in your this lifetime by your effort. This is a power. So uh, in the first analysis, please find your uh, unique power. Through that, you can find you are Buddha's children. You have a good existence. That is first a suggestion of Master Yuho Okab. Then second suggestion was discover your tendency or disposition as an accumulated enlightenment, accumulated something, Master said like that. This soul has a certain disposition or a tendency. Your soul was not created and left as it was. Uh, you have also created your own disposition through uh, hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands years of reincarnation. You have accumulated something, and it is deeply engraved in your soul. Uh, in, in the sense, humor is very, very similar. Everyone is similar. But actually, everyone is so diverse and different. Because it is not uh, ch by chance. It is because of a uh, uh, countless reincarnation. Countless reincarnation. Each one of us acquire his own disposition or soul tendency. That makes the difference of, of the uh, so many people. And uh, each person is different. And uh, we have good disposition, or sometimes bad disposition, which is called uh, karma. Karma is a bad part of our tendencies. That 
make uh, us kind of unhappy. But we have also uh, good disposition, good tendencies in us, each of us. So master taught us, please find your uh, kind of ex uh, uh, accumulated enlightenment that, when, uh, that you acquire through countless reincarnations. These tendencies are created uh, usually through some kind of profession in the past lives. You, each of you may have a, a good profession in the each uh, reincarnation, and through that uh, profession uh, work, acquire some kind of a disposition. Some people must be teaching people, uh, like to teach people, type student. That is a kind of character of the uh, teachers. Uh, teachers have a uh, unique characters. Also, some people are musicians. Some people are kind of scholars. Each profession have diff, uh, create this uh, uh, different tendencies or dispositions on our lives. So please think about yourself. Now find your soul tendency or disposition through which you can find your position or mission in your in this lifetime. So it is very very important to find your your true self. This is the second. This was the second uh, suggestion by Master Ryuho Kawa. Now we enter the second part of the master lecture, which is around 30 minutes. And um, in this lecture, uh, later part of the lecture, later part of the lecture, master uh, uh, uses the uh, example of a baseball. Baseball is not so popular in this country. <laughs> so you may think about the cricket <laughs> or other sports if you like. Okay, you can imagine yeah, through that kind of uh, uh, thinking. Okay, we enter the second part of master lecture. Enlightenment will ultimately lead you to transcend the boundary between you and others. But at the starting point, it's essential to know the difference between you and others. You may sometimes wonder why there are so many people in this world. 120 million in Japan and 5 billion in the world. They all have different faces, heights, ways of thinking, languages. Why are there so many? Why were so many people created? Why does everyone you meet have different ideas from yours? You may wonder like this. Other people do not just exist. They exist to teach you who you are. You will come to know yourself by looking at others. If you were born on an uninhabited island and lived like Robinson Crusoe, how would you know that you are a human being? You won't be able to recognize yourself. In this sense, we should be grateful that animals and plants exist. You can see how humans are different and understand what humans are. And thanks to other people, you will know who you are for the first time. Knowing yourself is important. Come to think of it, this is something animals cannot do. This is what makes human beings human. Knowing the difference between you and others and then recognizing yourself is an essential first step. Human beings are different from animals in that they have the ability to know the difference between themselves and others and the ability to use others as a mirror to recognize themselves. For example, you may have a pet dog. Even if you show him a mirror, he cannot recognize himself reflected in the mirror. Perhaps he'll keep barking at the mirror. After all, he has never seen his own figure, so he doesn't understand. 
he can only recognize it as an unknown creature. He cannot see it's he himself. He cannot recognize himself. So dogs and other animals don't yet know themselves in the truest sense. But fortunately, humans are given infinite opportunities to learn about themselves and others. One of the ways to learn about yourself and others is to encounter other people. Like today, when over 2,000 people have gathered, what do encounters bring us? Experience. The other is knowledge. We can acquire the ability to recognize things by gaining knowledge. Experience and knowledge are two critical sources. To know yourself and others. That's why, as I said earlier, you need to look within your mind and discover the core part, the pearl. Then, the next step is to analyze it. How does your pearl shine uniquely compared to other pearls? How big is your pearl? What shape does it have? You need to explore these points. You cannot see the true shape of your pearl, its true meaning or its true value just by looking at it. You need to look at other people's pearls to understand it. So the second step to enlightenment is learning from others. Some people may believe they can attain enlightenment on their own by isolating themselves in the mountains or in their houses. But these people will end up becoming a self-styled practitioner. And their enlightenment will only satisfy themselves. True enlightenment must be reliable and therefore verifiable. For your enlightenment to be verifiable, you need to know the difference between you and others clearly. You need to know who you are in contrast to others. You need to know your own unique pearl. So I dare say, those who cannot see or understand others cannot understand themselves either. That's my point. You may think it's enough to know yourself by shutting yourself up, but your mind is already blind when you think you have understood yourself. Enlightenment is not something you can gain on your own. By observing other people and examining their thoughts and the state of their minds, you need to know why human beings were created, how they were made, and what role you should play within that framework. Unless you understand this, you cannot claim to have known yourself. Listen well. If you don't know that, you are no different from mere ants crawling on the ground haphazardly. In the summertime, you may have seen hard-working ants crawling on the ground. They move forward haphazardly, going this way or that way while bumping into stones. Sadly, they can only react to what is in front of them. This means they cannot recognize themselves. Beyond the feelings or thoughts they have in each situation, or beyond the actions they take in that moment. 
They don't learn from others before taking action. That's how they are. They don't even know where they are, where they are heading to, or what obstacles they might face. They don't know these things. They only know what is in front of them. Those who believe they should attain enlightenment alone in their own framework are like these ants, I have to say so. From the perspective of someone viewing things from a higher position, they are pitiful. This example shows how miserable it is not to be able to recognize oneself objectively or learn from others. So the third step to enlightenment is to acquire a higher perspective. or greater insight. You can acquire such insight through the presence of other people and by the wisdom you gain from it. You can learn about yourself thanks to other people. And you can learn things by interacting with other people. Please take an interest in other people to truly know yourself. Some may believe they can attain enlightenment by shutting themselves away, but unfortunately, that's not the main road. Without taking an interest in other people, enlightenment is not possible. You cannot walk the path to enlightenment. Why not? As we always teach, the true road to enlightenment is in the path from Hinayana to Mahayana, from establishing yourself to giving love to others. This process is the main road to enlightenment. To walk this main road, you must always take an interest in other human beings. To do so, you must not be a bystander. Listen well, you must not be a mere bystander. You must not be a mere critic. The interest you take in others must lead you to reflect on yourself. You should not observe others just to be critical or judgmental. You must look at them, their actions and minds, and use that as material to reflect on yourself. Here lies the principle of self-improvement. What will happen as you continue this process? Your effort to improve yourself will serve to make the world a better place. The more you improve yourself, the better you will see others. You will come to understand why people act or think in a certain way and why they meet a certain outcome. This understanding is very important. You may think love and wisdom are two separate things. But they are not actually separate. You cannot truly give love to others without understanding them. You may believe you are giving love, or your actions may appear to be love. However, true love must nurture others. True love must make others better. Then, how can you tell if your love is improving others? To know that, you need the basis. The basis means the study of human beings or the general interest in other people. Without this general study of human beings, you cannot truly give love to others. Your love can end up being hypocrisy or self-deception. You may have a sense of guilt 
Men of you, hundreds or over 1,000 of you here probably have it. You may have a memory of having committed a sin at some point in life. You may feel bad about some mistake and feel like atoning for it. To be free of this guilt, people do what appears to be an act of love. Some people make donations, do voluntary work, or start charitable work after retirement. And among them are many who do so out of their sense of guilt. They are doing so because they want to be saved, not because they want to save others. They themselves want to be free of their burden. That's their motive, isn't it? Then you'll come to see there are two types of people among those who vaguely believe they are acting out of love. One is those who appear to be helping others, but are actually doing so for their own sake. There are many such people. What is the other type of people? They are the ones who help others out of the pure intention to do so. They act because they truly want to help. They are kind because they want to be. Their actions and words come out naturally. In a sense, they may appear too kind, but they love others because they like doing so or think it is their duty. There are such people. But there are not very many of them. There are still very few. What will be the consequences of these two types of people? What will become of people who love others for their own sake and people who love others for the sake of others? They will have completely opposite results. Those who live while loving others for the sake of others will find that they have truly improved themselves. What does this mean? Do you understand? Actually, those who help others to save themselves are only concerned about themselves. They crave praise from others to console their minds. Then, what about those who always want to give love to others? What kind of beings are they? In fact, they are very much like the sun. They are becoming like the being that keeps on giving without expecting any return. If such a being exists in the invisible world, it must be the will of God. The one who constantly gives without expecting anything in return is God or is very close to God. Being able to give to others limitlessly is a very important quality. It brings joy. In fact, being able to give itself is happiness. This is the happiness of a higher level. Once you truly know this level of happiness, you'll feel less joy in worldly pleasures or sensual pleasures. These things will no longer satisfy your mind. Within your limited time of 24 hours a day or several decades of life, how many people can you give love to? If giving love sounds too vague, how many people can you nurture? To how many people can you give dreams and reasons to live for? Can you make them feel happy to be alive? Can you make someone feel blessed for being given life in this lifetime? 
そういう気持ちにさせてあげることができるかどうか。この。Let me explain this further. From my books, you may have learned about heaven and hell. You may imagine heaven or hell starts from the moment you leave this world. However, heaven and hell are not of the other world, but an extension of this world. They exist here in this world. Over 2,000 people are here. And each of you is creating either heaven or hell right now. You are sharing the same space and are sitting next to each other. But some are creating heaven while others are creating hell. You may not know which world you are creating. Perhaps it's better not to know. It's fine for you not to know. But you are clearly creating one or the other. It's like a balance scale. It rarely keeps an even balance. One side is always heavier. It's clear if your life is heavenly or hellish. I talked about giving love. But what does it mean to make others feel happy to be alive? Or to give them hopes, ideals, or reasons to live? It means although these people were sinking because of the weight, you have managed to remove this weight and help them to come up. In other words, at that moment, one hell has disappeared. Listen carefully. You can eliminate the hell next to you while you are still alive. I call this act giving love. People are sinking toward hell because of the weight. They cannot take away the weight on their own because it's too heavy. They want to remove it somehow, but they cannot. The majority of people are like this. You can remove it for them. Only when you have understood them, their thoughts and their ideas. What are they worrying about? What are they struggling with? How should you approach them to alleviate their pain or anxiety? Unless you understand these things, you cannot remove their weight. Remove the weights from more people and make their minds lighter. If you can do this, you are becoming an expert of life. Don't you think so? A mind is the only thing you can take with you when you leave this world. So what other goal is there in life than to become a highly ranked expert of the mind? That's my point. How many people's minds did you alleviate? Everyone has this ability. You could call it the black belt of the mind. You may not be fully aware of such ability yet. But from the perspective of God, people have different levels of ability. The black belt, first dan, second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. Some people have a higher ability and unconsciously do the work of alleviating people's minds. As they interact with others. In companies, there are different jobs. Highly competent salespersons can produce good results every year. For some reason, they can do so consistently. Incompetent salespersons can only achieve poor results. The same goes for baseball players. Very few have a batting average of 0.300. Despite being in a slump, they can maintain a batting average of 0.300 by the end of the season. They have such an ability. In the world of the mind, too, there are people with a 0.200, 0.300, or 0.400 batting average. Increasing this batting average means raising the level of one's enlightenment. 
Let me use this analogy of baseball to explain the meaning of establishing oneself in the world of enlightenment. Players train themselves hard, they practice their swings, and study different types of pitches and the opponent's players. Acquiring the skill to maintain a high batting average through training is a self-establishment for them. As a result of such training, they'll be able to achieve good results and get a hit or a home run at the most crucial moments. Then the spectators will enjoy watching the games and the team members will be happy. Good players will make the games interesting and create many fans. The purpose of baseball lies in giving relaxation, joy, and enjoyment to many people. And good players can practice altruism in the world of baseball. Their establishing themselves will lead to altruism. In addition to hitting, players can also improve their pitching skills. Some pitchers can win 15 to 20 games a season. But even if the opponent cannot hit the ball, the game is still interesting. The spectators will be excited and admire the pitcher who pitches well. Good players either at bat or on the field can achieve good results and fascinate many people. I used baseball as an example, but similar games are going on inside our minds every day. In our workplace, family, or community. And we need the strong cleanup hitters and the ace pitchers there. We also need a catcher with a strong arm, a good first baseman, a third baseman, quick outfielders, and good base stealers. To make many people happy, there must be many good players within the world of the mind as well. The definition of a good player is a little difficult. In Japanese baseball, there is the Golden Players Club. It certifies players who hit over 2,000 hits or who throw over 200 winning games in their careers. Players with different abilities are measured according to certain criteria and are certified to join. Everyone has different characteristics, personalities, abilities, and intellectual and physical strengths. But despite these differences, there's a certain criterion to be met to be a good player. What is this criterion? Be it batters, pitchers, or pinch runners, these players have to perform well, bring joy and excitement to the spectators, and make the game interesting. They have to be such reputable players. How can this example be applied to our ordinary lives? For example, one criterion is how your presence affected your workplace. If you've brightened up the workplace or made work more exciting, that's good. You may have improved work efficiency and made everyone happy, or contributed to improve company performance. There are many ways, but at the very least, you have to understand your position first. Are you a catcher, first, second, or third baseman, or a good batter? Be aware of your position first and do your best. Focus on performing better. That is important. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Let me summarize my points. First, I talked about how enlightenment starts from discovering your own core. Start by discovering the core shining in your mind. But don't be satisfied with just finding your inner light or the pearl within. 
Next, you have to know other people. It's important to know various people and re-examine yourself. Through this process, you'll be able to understand others and take wonderful actions, giving love to others. There is yet another step. What is the next step? It is entering a world of the experts of the mind or a way to become a professional. You can acquire the ability to make the world better or to brighten up people's minds. Thus, the journey that started from taking an interest in yourself and finding the core within will lead you to turn to others. Then it will come back to you again, and you'll go on to explore the world of humans. After having established yourself and recognized the outside world, you'll naturally enter the path to change the world in a concrete way and make people be more positive and better. At that time, you need professional skills. You should not remain an amateur. If you are to play, do it well. Aim to be the cleanup batter or the ace pitcher. There is winning or losing in baseball, but not in the world of the mind. The more everyone strives, the better the world will be. If there were to be losing, it would be the world of hell. In fact, hell was not part of God's plan, nor is it something welcomed. But those with mistaken thoughts temporarily go there. In a way, they are sick people. They are suffering in hell for decades or hundreds of years. Some of them cannot bear the suffering of hell and escape by coming to the earth. It's true they possess people like you who are living on the earth, do bad things and cause misfortune. I don't want to call them enemies, but they could be described as such. If we were to think of them as hypothetical opponents, we are now fighting in a game to decrease the area of hell by defending and attacking well and earning points. And this is the end of the second part of my lecture. Okay, uh, in this part, Master, first we Master taught about finding your true self, then he taught about uh, knowing others, observing others. Master told us, uh, Enlightenment will ultimately lead you to transcend the boundary between you and others. And but uh, the, at the starting point, knowing the difference between you and others is essential. In fact, other people do not just exist. They exist to teach you who you are. They teach you who you are. And uh, uh, you will come to know yourself by looking at others. Uh, okay. This is a very important point. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, young children, uh, very young children, love animals. <laughs> By looking at animals, they know they are quite different from oneself. So by learning, observing the animals, they come to know uh, he or she is a human. <laughs> it's very interesting. Also, they come to know about others like uh, father, mother, and uh, brothers, sisters, and uh, they enter the school and they met uh, friends. And uh, through, the, through, the con uh, through the kind of uh, connection between friends, they come to know they, each of them are different from others. Okay, so by observing others, we can gauge your true value. You have a power within you. You have a special uh, enlightenment uh, unique to you through the uh, course of reincarnation. But unless you are not examined uh, which kind of uh, speciality you have, 
by observing others, you cannot truly see yourself. That is a very, very important point. By observing others, you can find your true uh, position in this society or true mission, your life. So you may have a kind of special skill. You both of it is a very good one. But uh, by comparing your skill to other people, you come to know which value you have in your profession. Okay, this is a very, very important pro uh, process. Then comes the third part. Walk the true road to enlightenment. He mentioned the black belt. Black belt is related to judo or karate like that. It's a, it's a kind of a symbol of, of mastery. Uh, so you must work from establishing yourself to give love to others. Uh, master mentioned it as uh, Hinayana. Hinayana means a small vehicle, small vessel. And Mahayana is a big, uh, big vehicle, a big vessel. From establishing yourself, first you must concentrate uh, establishing yourself, learning many things, study, or, uh, or improve yourself. This is the first step. Then, after this, this establishing yourself, you come to know others and then start giving love. This is a process of a true road to enlightenment. Uh, and for establishing yourself, you must know the general study of human beings. What is general study of human beings? Firstly, we should learn the truth, Buddha truth taught by Master Ryuho Okawa, which tells us about humanity in general, how our mind works in accordance with the laws created by the Buddha or God. And also we can uh, see others in, uh, in a very objective way. So by learning yourself, by studying other people, you can acquire the general study of human being. This is a, becoming the best basis, foundation of an uh, important study or establishing yourself. And Master taught us, giving love to others means to save people from the agony of hell while living on us. So actually there are many people who are problems, sufferings, misery, miserable situations. Uh, these kind of people who are actually living in hell while here, while she was still living. So we can alleviate their agony by giving some advice, helping in many ways. So this is a true act of love to help people from the agony of hell. So this is very, very important. And by giving love to others, we can feel a joy of higher level than worldly pleasures. Why? Why? It is because it is a true love, true love. We humans are essentially love. So when we are actually love others, we are very glad because we are given light from God or Buddha himself. When, while we are giving love, we are blessed by God. This creates our utmost joy in our mind. Then Master taught us, please aim to become the black belt holder of the mind. Black belt holder of the mind. It is another way of saying, please become bodhisattva, or please become angels to help others. This is a way of happy science. We are now working on that way by learning truth and try to convey the truth to other people. Now we enter the last part of Master Lecture today. I just mentioned hell and the spirits in hell. I want you to think about them as well. This is by no means someone else's problem. To be blunt, I could draw a line to divide the 2,500 people here to see who'd go to hell. I could draw a line here or perhaps there. 
according to the batting average, about half of the people would go to hell. If so, you could well be one of them. Don't you think so? It doesn't matter whether you are wearing a staff armband. I cannot say exactly because I don't check each individual. Same is true for the camera crew. So this is by no means someone else's problem. It is your own issue. You may loathe the evil spirits or feel you must save them, but you yourself can become like them. What will you do then? You must consider this. As you become an expert of the mind or an expert of life and become able to guide many people, you will experience an evil temptation, so you need to be careful. You'll think, I've completed my discipline, so I must point out others' bad points and correct them. There's no problem with me, I won't make mistakes anymore. You may come to feel this way. Once you reach a certain level, you'll step into a dangerous situation. You'll start to feel that you are different from others. This is the difficult part in the world of professionals. Just as it is difficult for even great pitchers to keep winning, or how any good player hits a slump, you'll face a dangerous period. The more you gain positive results in solving others' problems, or experience extraordinary miracles and phenomena and start attracting others' admiration, the more cautious you must be. You need to remind yourself that you are just another person. If you forget this perspective, you will start to make a serious mistake. You may believe you are ascending on a high-rise elevator but are actually starting to head downward without realizing it. You could be waiting to reach heaven, but end up in a dark place. This can happen, so you must be careful. There are many such people. Many high-ranking people end up this way, whether or not they know about the world of the mind. Those in a higher position who have guided many people Never imagine they'd be one of them. But this unpreparedness is most dangerous. Some politicians today are causing many problems now. I don't know where they'll end up after death, but they're in a dangerous zone. When problems happen on a national level, they're being tested to see how they'll tackle the problems and overcome them. Even a successful person is tested, how will he overcome an evil temptation? If he fails, he'll end up in hell. If he manages to overcome it, he'll develop an even higher ability to do greater work. The same can be said for those undergoing spiritual discipline. When you acquire a certain level of ability, you'll be in danger. Then what should you do? At such times, I want you to reconsider the meaning of self-reflection. There is self-reflection to discover the pearl within, which you practice at an early stage. There is also self-reflection on your relationships with other people. To pursue further, there is a grander, more positive self-reflection to see if you could have done better to save or nurture other people. The first self-reflection is to discover the light within. The second is to examine the relationships with others. These are negative approaches to see if you have any negative aspects. The next stage is the positive self-reflection to nurture others. Check and see if you have made any mistakes in not doing anything. You may have focused on negative self-reflection. 
to see if there were any mistakes in what you did, said and thought. To see if you didn't take action when you could, or if you didn't give any thoughts or advice to someone when you could. You can do such positive self-reflection to accelerate the building of utopia. This level is quite high. But upon reaching this level, you need to polish yourself once again. I will soon publish the True Eightfold Path. It comprises four lectures on self-reflection I gave in a dojo in Tokyo. You need to be proactively giving love to others. To be able to truly practice the Eightfold Path, you need the experience of giving love. A beginner cannot truly practice the Eightfold Path. You need to master the Eightfold Path if you want to advance from what we call the world of our hearts, the upper realm of the Sixth Dimension, to the world of Bodhisattvas. Without it, you cannot advance to a higher level on the road to enlightenment. The practice of the Eightfold Path is indispensable. The Eightfold Path has different elements. You need to examine yourself with the eyes of an expert. The first is right view. Did you see things rightly? This is very difficult. To know what is right first, you need to discover your light within, gain the ability to see others, and make efforts to proactively turn this world into utopia. Only through these dynamic experiences can you see what is right. You cannot see what is right if you are confined within your own shell. By accumulating such real experiences, you'll come to know the world yourself and others and see what is right. You cannot easily see things rightly if you don't have such real experiences. The same can be said of speaking rightly. If you cannot speak rightly, should you just sit in meditation without saying a word? No, you shouldn't. Right speech has a positive aspect. It has the power to change the world. Words are one of the powers you can use to make the people you meet happy and to give them love. Collapse, discord, and troubles in the family are all caused by words. Most causes lie in words. Families fall apart due to the misuse of words. If so, the opposite is also possible. You can build a wonderful family using words. This is definitely possible. It's very simple to reflect on this. If there's discord between you and your spouse, See how often you have treated your spouse as a wonderful person. Have you expressed words of admiration? Imagine you are on your deathbed and today is your last day. Look back from the time you got married. How many kind words did you say to your spouse? Reflect on it. Perhaps you haven't said much. You could have offered more kind words. You could have done so every day. You could have done so every morning, afternoon, and evening. But you didn't. You will come to realize this. The Eightfold Path starts from right view, then right thought, right speech, right living, and so on. And you explore rightness in various ways. But let me put it simply. Imagine today is your last day. Imagine your life ends today and look back at how you have lived. Reflect on the relationships with the people you've met. 
You will die and leave this world today. How will you look at yourself and others? At that time, if tears don't well up, you are not a human being. If you look back at your life knowing you will die today, and you don't shed a single tear, it means you have had an arid, desert-like life. You have lived without any strong feelings or emotions or tears. Know that you are such a person, a person who doesn't shed any tears when looking back at your life. No matter how high your position or income is, you still have a long way to go. You are far from being a true human. It means you have lived a desert-like, barren life. Please reflect on this. What is it that human beings should do? Whether you are young or old, man or woman, there are things you must do. All of you have come here today. This is a simple thing. When you get home, reflect on yourself alone. Imagine you will die at this moment and look back at your past. Remember your parents, spouse, children, friends, teachers, and others, and know your own history. If tears don't well up at that time, you are not real, or rather, you are not a human being. You are not a true human being if tears don't fall. If you fail to see your true self in the dust and dirt of this third-dimensional world, you are not a true human. You have yet to become a human being. If possible, please check each element of the Eightfold Path. Right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right living, right effort. Right will and right meditation. I have already explained all this. Please check them one by one. Then you will be able to see many things compared to the time you first entered the gate of self-reflection. At this point, remove the dust and dirt of your mind once again and correct the mistakes or wrong thoughts you had in the past. Only then will you be able to enter the world of bodhisattvas, the true world of love. To enter the world of love, you need to be hit by the rain of dharma. Without shedding the holy tears called the rain of dharma, you cannot enter the world of love. Unless you remove the mistaken thoughts and feelings stuck to you, you can never enter the world of pure love. This teaching is not just for you. The same applies to happy science executives and lecturers. Without reflecting on their minds, they too cannot continue to be a true human nor can they become a true bodhisattva. I too am walking the same path every day. It may appear as if I'm talking proudly from a podium, but I have never ended a single day without reflecting on my way of life. This is true even now. In the morning before coming up to this podium, I reflected on myself in light of the Eightfold Path. You may be satisfied as long as you don't commit any wrongdoings. But for me, holding this first public lecture in front of 2,500 people in Kyushu would have been impossible on my own. When I imagine how many people have made efforts to make this happen, I cannot hold back my tears. I thank you very much for today. Let us continue to work together. Thank you, Master Hoka. This is the last part of the lecture. Okay, I have the last part in the short. 
So this was to enter the pure world of love, pure world of love, which is the world of Bodhisattva, through self-reflection. Uh, Master taught us the three point. Firstly, we must watch out for the devil's temptation when we enter the level of expert. We become when after we become a kind of a knowing very well, we become kind of proud or become conceited and think we are kind of special people. So in that point, the danger of going down will start. So we be, must be care very careful about that. Secondly, Master taught us the, the proactive self-reflection of what you didn't or what you could have done more or better. So uh, usually we self-reflect on a negative thing we did, but the uh, Master taught us about the positive self-reflection, which we could have, should have, uh, especially when think about your, uh, okay, we should give more love to others when uh, we are not a uh, good relation with your spouse or the family members or the friends. We should think about how we could give love better to others. Please think about that. That is a point of uh, good self-reflection. And then, third point. Shed the holy tears, which is called the drain of Dharma, through self-reflection, assuming today is the last day of your life. So, uh, shedding the tears of uh, uh, holy tears, which come out when we have a deep self-reflection, this is a very, very important to to wash away the dust on our minds. So we are creating a false self in the course of decades of lives. By, but through the kind of deep self-reflection, especially when we shed tears, uh, we can wash away this false self. In uh, the laws of, sun, laws of the sun, Master taught us that we have four kinds of false self, such as the self that takes love from others, the self that takes love from others. Then comes the self that doesn't believe in Buddha or God, the self that doesn't believe in Buddha and God, the self that makes no diligent effort. Yeah, ring the bell. <laughs> then, uh, the shell self that is full of attachment, or oh, all four must be related to each of us. So by focusing on this point and uh, self-reflect on yourself as if it was the last day of your life, life we will come to will come to shed tears of regret. That is when we can shed our true self. So. After this today's lecture, when you are in the home, please have time to think about yourself in the kind of meditation, self-meditation. Okay, this is the last part of this lecture. And I have some kind of information for coming things. Uh, we have a coming seminar program on next Saturday on self-reflection. It is lifetime self-reflection. Lifetime self-reflection. You can self-reflect on your whole lifetime through, uh, from birth to this day, maybe three decades, four decades, I don't know, uh, like five decades or so. Uh, by through this kind of a self-reflection, you can shed, shed uh, tears of regret to this, uh, uh, wash away the whole self. This is a very important occasion. So I recommend many of you join uh, this time. And the next Sunday service uh, is a master's lecture about uh, the secret of multidimensional universe, which is quite different uh, from uh, in this uh, today lecture is focusing on, on our own enlightenment. It is very personal, but uh, next time it is carry very much deep, deep, which is come near to Buddha's enlightenment. So it is very, very expensive, no, 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 extensive uh, uh, lecture. 
So I want you to join next time too. Okay. Finally, we are come to the end. So we like to uh, recite the prayer to the Lord, prayer to El Cantare together. Okay, you have a. Please take the uh, prayer together. Recite together. Prayer to El Cantar. Lord El Cantar, you are our Lord, Buddha and Savior. We believe you are the master of masters, the highest God of this planet Earth. We believe you have the supreme power, both in heaven and on Earth. You are the great spiritual being, the united consciousness of Buddha and God. Lord El Cantar, we believe you will lead all people to true happiness. We believe the fourfold path of love, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress perfects the principles of happiness. And we truly believe these principles will save the entire world. O oh Lord, please grant us the holy mission to spread the truth all over the world. We will cross the vast ocean, the lighter beacon of truth in every corner of the world. O oh Lord, please entrust us with your great vow to save all humankind. We will devote our lives to creating Buddha and Utopia. Lord El Cantare, as long as you are in heaven and the disciples are on earth, we will hand down a mission to future generations to achieve your great vow. We, the disciples of El Cantare, will join together to become the ship of your great vow to save the people and bring them a show of enlightenment. O oh Lord, we thank you very much for granting us a prayer to El Cantare. Okay, uh, this concludes today's Sunday service. Thank you for joining. We we'll see you next time. Thank you, Jake. Maybe it was the last time, last minute joining. Thank you. Yes, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm still working. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're here. <laughs> How are you now? Um, driving. Driving. Oh, dear. Dri no, no. <laughs> driving in Darwin. No, no. Oh. I'm driving in Sydney. Driving, driving customers. Okay. <laughs> okay. See you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.